Hey! Okay, so this session is about the art of the AST or the abstract syntax tree. And let's talk about why we should care about the abstract syntax tree. So we should care because that you, if you're using JavaScript today, you're obviously using a lot of JavaScript tools. And you, with this concept, you can extend those tools. You can make them do something that the original tool authors uh, didn't plan for you to do. So this is specifically what we're going to be talking about today and going to be learning how to do. So let's review it. We're going to be talking about uh, how to write your own linting rules to enforce your team's code conventions or find errors in your code uh, as part of your build process. You can write your own JavaScript transpiling code. So you can write beautiful JavaScript without boilerplate code and still have it run anywhere, even if the older browsers don't support the new syntax. And we're going to be talking about something which is a little uh, less known than the first two. You're going to write code mods or code modifications. And that's uh, a program that can run over your code and refactor it for you. For example, a use case would be to take thousands of files, a very large code base, and transform it from ES5 into a new, beautiful ES6. So we only have 30 minutes or so. This is a pretty big undertaking. And the reason we're going to be able to do this in only 30 minutes is because of the work that the, the, the people behind these the different uh, libraries uh, did. So each one of these problems is solved by one of these programs. And not only did they solve these problems in a very a nice way for you to use, but they also plan these libraries from the ground up to be extensible for you to write your own plugin and make the make the library do what you want. And um, something else that's going to make it possible to learn all this in only 30 minutes is because even though these libraries solve different problems, they're all they're all using the same abstraction, the same concept that you have to learn, and that's basically 90% of all you need in order to learn how to write uh, custom code for all of these. So the concept we're talking about is ASTs and the visitor pattern, which we're going to explain. Uh, this is me. I work at JavaScript Israel, where our mission is to reinvent shopping across different platforms, web, mobile, Internet of Things. So, uh, <laughs> see you, Israel. We're hiring at JavaScript Israel, if, you, if you're interested. Come talk to me. Um, and this is uh, some of the links where you can find me. So the this. This notion that ASTs can be used to help you write JavaScript tools is not only relevant for the three uh, libraries that I showed you, it's relevant for basically almost all the JavaScript tooling that's out there today. This, this is just a couple of examples. So the bits in your editor or IDE that understands your code, give, gives you autocomplete or IntelliSense, that's based on ASTs. Uh, all the model, model bundlers, uh, right, your um, Webpack, all that stuff, um, things that minify your code, also based on ASTs. So it's definitely something that's worth learning. So what is it? So it's not something that's unique to JavaScript. Basically, all a, all a syntax tree is is a, a different representation of your same source code. So if we take your source code, your original code, and we turn it into a tree data structure, that's a syntax tree. The word abstract here, it just means that not necessarily all of the information from the original source code is retain, retained when we transform it into a tree. So if you're writing a compiler, you don't care about comments. You don't care about white space. So it throws all that out when it turns your code into a syntax tree. But actually, a lot of the parsers that, parsers that I'm going to show today are actually capable of outputting a concrete syntax tree. So it remembers everything about the original code. And you can take the tree, apply the reverse function, and get back the exact same code down to every character if you want, if you need that. So this is an example of a really simple, simple example of a code, and it's matching uh, AST syntax tree. So this is basically the simplest program there is, um, var foo equals bar. Let's, so let's review the tree and see why it makes sense that this would be the way to describe this code. So we always have the root node in our tree, which is the program, which has a body. Now, in, in this case, we only have one statement in our code. So there's only one statement here. That's the variable declaration. It has the kind, which is the var, and the uh, variable declarator, which is the identifier and the literal. So bar is just a hard-coded string. That's why it's just a literal. I'm a programmer. I don't like looking at these diagrams. It reminds me of school. I would much rather work with something I feel much more at home with. So this is just a JSON object, which is the exact same representation of the same syntax tree. As you can see, you have the different nodes here. 
Uh, and now somebody had to decide that this is the correct way to represent this original source code. So obviously it's going to be a tree structure, but still somebody decided to call these properties with these names and so on. So there's a standard in the industry. And if you've been working in the web for a while, then you know that there isn't always a standard. A lot of times we can't agree on things, but I'm happy to report that in this case, all the tools that I show you today pretty much use the same type of syntax tree, the same standard, the same specification for a syntax tree, which is called the ES tree, ECMAScript tree. And um, you can take a look at the example here. Now, the thing to note about the ES tree standard is that each node has a type property as, as the name of the property. And the value of the property is just a set list of known nodes that can be found in any JavaScript program. Obviously, it's a set list because uh, the, the sy JavaScript syntax is uh, limited and you can only have a certain amount of nodes. So that's going to come in handy. You should remember that you always have, no matter which node you're looking at, you always have the type property. And based on the value of the type property, you can know to how to expect uh, what other, other properties that node is going to have. So for example, the program node will always have a body property, which will contain the rest of the nodes. Uh, these are the four steps that you have when you're working with uh, ASTs. We're going to go through all of them. And so you either have only two steps or you have uh, all, the whole four. It, it depends on what kind of tool you're working on. So if you're working on a tool that only takes JavaScript as input, you're only going to have the parse and traverse step. So your linters, your uh, code coverage tools, they only care about reading your original JavaScript. They don't do anything. They don't output JavaScript. If you're working on a tool that outputs JavaScript, then you have um, the uh, manipulate and the generate code steps. So the parse step is pretty straightforward. There's not a lot of room for you to add your own logic to the parse step. You basically just have to choose one of the many open source parsers that are out there. All a parser is is a library that has a parse function that takes your original source code as a string and returns an object, which is the AST. This is the, uh, where we're going to spend most of, that, uh, most of our time here in the talk. It's in this uh, website called AST Explorer. So if you remember just one link from today, uh, make it that one, astexplorer.net. And um, it's basically a tool like, um, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, JS Fiddle or uh, JS Bin. Uh, it's an online tool where you can just paste code on the left and see the matching AST after it was uh, ran through a parser on the right. So, if we take a look at uh, this code here, we can see the JSON object, which is the representation of the tree. Or you can take a look at the, uh, the tree view here, which is a lot nicer because you can expand and collapse any of the nodes. As you choose the node here, it highlights it on the other side and vice versa. If I click on something here, it shows me the way this node looks here. So the traverse step, that's where you're going to have to put in your own logic because you're traversing the tree because you want to check something uh, within the tree. And we're going to show this with ESLint, and we're going to solve the first problem that we want to solve. We want to write our own lint rule. So if you're not familiar with the linter in general, uh, linter is something that can be found in many languages. It's something that does static analysis over your code. It checks your code for uh, possible errors, which you can discover early instead of just in production. Or you could decide on the things that you care about, things that aren't errors, but you, you care about the style, like a style guide for your code, the way your team writes code, and enforce it so nobody can commit uh, code that violates that rule. So this is the output from uh, ESLint. Sorry, shield your eyes from this ugliness. Uh, so one of the ways of using ESLint is just to tell it ESLint in the command line, look at this uh, file, this JavaScript file, and tell me what errors you're find, you find within. Now, the nice, things about, the nice thing about ESLint is uh, that it's totally unopinionated. So the first time you install it, even if you give it thousands of lines of JavaScript, it's going to review all of them and tell you your code is perfect. I didn't find any errors because it doesn't force you to use any errors. You have to opt into the rules you care about, and you can create your own, which is what we're going to do. The first rule I'm going to show is just copied from the ESLint source, co source code, so it's a built-in ESLint rule. This is my original source code. I have a debugger statement here. If you're not familiar with the debugger statement, it's a reserved keyword in JavaScript, and you can trigger a breakpoint from your code, which is great for debugging, for working on your code, but it's not something that we would want to ship to production, because if your user has DevTools open, it's going to uh, just make his browser's, uh, browser get stuck, and you don't want that. So ideally, I would want to find any debugger statements in my code before I ship it to production. And this is what this rule does. Now, I'm back in uh, AST Explorer, but now I have these two new windows here at the bottom. That's because I have the transform uh, button turned on with ESLint mode. 
and that exposes these two new panels. So I can paste the new ESLint rule here on the left-hand side, and it's gonna show me the ESLint output on the right side. So for this original source code here on top at the left, which has the debugger statement, it's gonna say, I found an unexpected debugger statement at line number two, you should correct your code, maybe remove it. So let's see how this rule is written. As you can see, it's only like seven lines of code plus lots of fluff, so it's very simple. All an uh, ESLint rule is, is just a function that returns an object where the object has a property where the name of the property is one of the known types that are available in an AST. So we said that AST, there's only a set number of uh, possible types. This is one of them. So I, I'm looking for debugger statement here, right? Because that's what I'm trying to solve. So if I just click on debugger statement here on my original source code and take a look at the tree, it's going to show me that the type of debugger statement is debugger statement. Okay, because debugger is a reserved keyword, it, it has its own type. So that's why I wrote debugger statement here. And the value I give is a function that's going to be called for every uh, debugger statement in my code. And what I do in this function is I just uh, throw an error, report a violation, I found an unexpected debugger statement. And that's what causes this here. Uh, to give me the alert I expected. Okay, so it's pretty simple. I don't have to worry about traversing the tree. All I have to do is tell the engine what kind of type I care about, and it, it's gonna call my callback function for every uh, node of that type in the tree, and then I can do something like report an error. So let's talk about why you would want to create your own rule, because the one I just showed you comes built in with the ESLint. This is a real case scenario. This happened to me. This is what got me started uh, tinkering with the uh, ESLint and with ASTs. I found that ESLint acts in this way, and it wasn't what I expected, so I went on the issues uh, on GitHub, and I told them, I, I didn't say I think it's a bug because I knew it was probably on purpose, but I said, this really shouldn't behave in this manner. And they said, no, this, we consider this a feature, but you can write your own rule and fix it if you want. So that's what I did. So first, let's explain the problem. This is my original code here. I just have two statements, console log, and I call something uh, on the DC Comics uh, object. And what I want to do is, because DC Comics is not defined here, it's not imported via uh, ES6 models, and it's not defined elsewhere in the code, it's undefined. I want to, I want to know about it. I want it to throw a, a, a lint error. Okay, console is okay, because console is built into the browser or node or whatever. I don't, want it to, I don't want to get an alert for it. And what I have here down at the bottom is, again, copied from the ESLint source code. It's called the no undef rule, no undefined rule. And it works seemingly as expected, because it tells me that DC Comics is not defined. It doesn't say anything about console. This works as expected. But what uh, surprised me is that if I put window dot here in my original code, which is semantically the same, because anything that's in the global scope is also a property of window, in browser anyway, I, I, get a, I don't get any uh, lint violation. Lint rule not fired. Okay, so if I'm working with uh, maybe 50 developers and uh, somebody is really rushing home one day and he's breaking the build because he didn't have this uh, window dot before, so he realizes he can just do a window dot and uh, nobody will ever know, and I, I want to catch cases like that as well. So in this case, I had to write my own rule, and we're going to take a look at how it's written. It's also very short, and uh, you can see in this case, I wrote window.dccomics, and this time I do get a violation and this is my own custom rule, so I could uh, make up whatever kind of warning uh, text that I uh, could think of. So I wrote uh, DC Comics piggybacks on window. In Hebrew, uh, um, so let's see how this rule is written. Again, I have this object, and I have to tell it what kind of node to uh, call my callback function on. And this time, I care about a member expression node. Why? Because window.dccomics, that's a, a member expression. A member expression where the left-hand side, a window, is the object, and the right-hand side is the property. Okay, so this is my callback. This time I have to do another check. I don't just report an error as soon as I find the node because I only care about a specific case. So only if the left-hand side, the object, is window, and the right-hand side is not a known global property like console, then it's a case where I want to report an error. So uh, this, this thing about window, obviously it just says if window, its name is, is the, the object.name is window, that's pretty clear. Uh, the thing about the right-hand side, 
the way I distinguish between DC Comics, which is not permitted, and console, which is permitted, uh, I do that here. So ESINT exposes something called the global scope. I can just ask it what's in the global scope. It also has internally a whitelist of known uh, globals that are found in a browser, and it knows that console is okay and that DC Comics isn't. So if it's not one of these, I can report an error. So without knowing, we just use a design pattern called the visitor pattern. Okay, the fact that I didn't have to traverse the tree on my own, I didn't have to write that logic, I could just say I care about member expression nodes or I care about debugger statement nodes and call this function, this function for any one of them that you find in the, in the tree. That's called the visitor pattern because it visits, it visits the, the tree on my behalf and it calls my logic. I didn't have to worry about it. And we're going to use this pattern also in the other tools that we're going to take a look at. And the manipulate step is going to be uh, in, in any case where we want to output JavaScript as well. The most famous tool that does this is Babel. So if you're not familiar just with a couple of words, Babel was originally a project called 6 to 5, convert ES6 mode into ES6 code into ES5 uh, code. And at some point, they realized that what they solved is really a generic runner that can transpile your code. So now it's, it's just called Babel, and you can write your own plugins that can do anything, not necessarily just ES6 to ES5 conversion. So let's take a look at a Babel, Babel uh, plugin. Again, this is a default uh, plugin that comes with uh, Babel. We're going to see how it works, and then we're going to write our own. So this is the code that we're going to be uh, using as an example. It might look familiar because it's the exact same code from before. Because I still have this code with the debugger statement, but if you think about it, why would I need to uh, alert the, the developer if I found the debugger statement in my code? All the developer is going to do is remove it. There's no logic. You don't really need a human, a human to do it. So uh, what I expect to have happen is if I write the debugger statement in my original code for debugging, as part of the build process to prepare it to production, all I have to do is remove it, get rid of it. So this is what this plugin does for me. Uh, I'm in uh, ASD Explorer again, but in, in, in the transform uh, mode, but this time using Babel. So I have my original code, the Babel plugin at the bottom, and the Babel output. And as you can see, the debugger statement is removed. So this is the Babel plugin that does this. It's called No Debugger. It's pretty similar to before. I still have an object which returns a, I still have a function which returns an object. This time, it has to be wrapped with this uh, visitor object, which reminds us we're using the visitor pattern. And the exact same thing. The key has to match the set of known types in uh, the ASD. And this function gets called for each time it encounters such a node. I get this path variable, uh, which is just the node with some extra metadata. And then I call path.remove. I can only use something which is a known type in uh, ES3, okay, in the standard that describes how do you convert the code into an ASD. Uh, so the question was, wh how would we decide that this is a, like debugger statement, for example, how is that a, a, a known uh, type you can use? So the standard that defines what are the uh, available types is ES3, the thing that describes uh, the way, the right way, so to speak, to convert your code into ASD. And uh, it was actually um, reverse engineered from uh, the Mozilla uh, SpiderMonkey internals. That's the way, in their JavaScript engine, that's the way they chose to, uh, to, to call everything in the ASD. And somebody reverse engineered it, published it as a specification, and now it's pretty much the standard. But if you don't know the, the node and the type, you just click on the word here, and then it shows you uh, what are, what's its matching type. Okay, so this is a defa default uh, Babel plugin. Let's write our own. So this first the problem we're trying to solve. So I'm sure there are Angular users here. Angular users, show of hands. Yeah, lots of them. Okay, so I'm sure you're familiar with this problem. Uh, the way that you uh, uh, describe your dependencies for your controller, for example, right? You want to have uh, these injected. So because I wrote uh, greeter and uh, dollar scope here. The magic of Angular is going to see if there's a service called Greeter, and it's going to inject it here, right? Dependency injection. Uglification, minification, these things are going to be turned into like A and B, and there's no service called A and B, so it's not going to work as expected. Uh, for this, we have this longer uh, syntax where I have to describe each one of my parameters again using strings. And strings don't get changed during minification, and that's why it still works. But I have to maintain this list, right? Every time I change one of the dependencies, I have to re uh, copy it here. It's not, it's, I would much rather work in the first way as well. So using Babel, what we can do is we can write our code using the nice shorter syntax and have it 
uh, transform for us automatically as part of our uh, build pipeline into the longer format which is safe during minification. So as you can see, this is what happened here. I have both forms here, but the implicit nicer form is transformed into the longer uh, minification safe form. How did I achieve this with uh, Babel? Pretty much the same solution, but this time it came out just a few more lines of code, maybe like 20 something lines of code. I start with getting, setting a callback for each time it encounters a call expression. Why call expression? Because a uh, controller is actually a function that I call. Then I have a set of checks. I don't care about any call, ex uh, call expression. I'm going to have many call expressions in my code. But I only care about uh, if it's a controller, if, it's, if it has a certain amount of arguments, uh, if it's uh, some model.controller, et cetera. So that's what all these if statements are for. They're uh, to see if this is not the case I care about, then just return, don't do anything. But at the very bottom here, these three lines, these are the ones that actually do the transformation. Uh, if I find that it is the case I care about, then I need to turn each one of the parameters of the original function into a string literal, into a hard-coded string, add the original function to the array, and do a transformation. So replace the original function with the new array. Don't worry if you didn't uh, follow uh, everything. I'm going to post the links later. But the thing to note here is that this is a problem that we could solve, and it's relatively simple. I just have to look at the tree, the good example, the bad example, and see how I can transform the bad example into the good example. Generating code. Now, you might think that generating code is uh, kind of like the parse step, where I don't have to apply any logic. I don't even have to think about it. But there is something that we have to think about. Uh, and we're going to explain what that is in a minute. So JS Code Shift. Um, JS Code Shift, the best way to explain what it does is by comparing it to uh, Babel. So JS Code Shift is a tool that takes JavaScript as input and uh, produces JavaScript as output. And it's just a generic runner that does this. Uh, you have to intervene with your own um, plugins and tell it what, what transformations to run, exactly like Babel. The building block, the thing, the plugin is composed of a function that takes an AST as input and transforms it into a new AST, the same as Babel, and they're both by Facebook. Uh, JS Code Chef is actually open sourced by Facebook, and Babel hired the guy who, sorry, Facebook ha hired the guy who wrote uh, Babel, and it's heavily used by React and all that. So, if it seemingly does the same thing, why is it, and it's by the same company? Why would we need two tools? So the answer is within the intended use case. Uh, Babel is, they treat it as a compiler. Every time you change your code, you produce new code, you ship it to production, the next time you deploy a new version, you throw that code out. The, the idea with JS Code Shift is to refactor your code, um, to actually take this code and commit it back into GitHub, right? So it's probably going to be committed under your name. You don't want it to be ugly machine code that got generated and uh, it produced bugs. So it, you have to be very careful, and it has to produce quality code. It has to respect your white space preferences, because if it just changes the entire, uh, it, it takes a, a, a file that was with tabs, regenerates it with spaces, it's going to look in Git history like the whole file was changed. So it has to understand that and do an intelligent uh, transformation based on the original white space that you used. So the best use case for Babel would be to take ES6 and convert it down to ES5. And in JS Code, if it's exactly the opposite, the best use case would be to take my ES5 code. Now, everyone's talking about ES6. Nobody's talking about the large code bases built with uh, ES5 that we've written in the last couple of years. Uh, they're still here. We need to maintain them. We can either gradually, manually transform them into ES6, or we could use a tool like this that can do it for us intelligently. Babel, we use it all the time. Every time we ship a new version to production, JS Code Shift is for refactoring, so we only use it once when we want to refactor our code. Now, I'm going to show you JS Code Shift in a minute, but just, again, show of hands, who thinks that uh, running my uh, code through a machine, taking the new code and committing it, and deploying it to production and going home is crazy, and he's never going to do it, it's too risky? OK? Great. OK, so I'm going to be talking about that. So let's take a look at uh, an example of a JS Code Shift transformation. This is my original code. And what I want to do is I want to find all these ugly var declarations and turn them into new, sexy, shiny uh, let uh, transformations in ES6. This is, what, this is the JS Code Shift uh, transformation. Again, as you can guess, I have transform mode, JS Code Shift mode here. So 
from my root node, which contains my entire tree, find any variable declaration with, of, of type var, and for each one, create a new declaration of type let, otherwise the declaration is the same, and swap them, swap the original with the new one. Again, don't worry about it, every single piece of syntax here, because if you got the gist of it, that's fine. And indeed, you can see that I have an original var declaration here. It got transformed into a let uh, keyword here. Right, so let and if aren't interchangeable, they have a different semantic meaning. And in fact, this code here uh, kind of highlights the problem. Before, because var is a function scope and not uh, block scope, a color of sky, it's in, inside the if, but I can still do console log, it's still gonna work as expected. In let, it's block scope, it's not gonna be uh, available elsewhere, so console log, uh, console of sky is gonna throw an error. So this relates to what I said initially about who thinks it's crazy to transform your code uh, using this stuff. So if you spend, like I did, five minutes to write this transformation, yeah, it's gonna be pretty silly to commit it and deploy it to production and go home and turn off my phone so I'm not uh, reachable. So Facebook released, along with the tool JS Code Shift, they also released a number of transformation uh, that they wrote to transform ES5 to um, ES6. Uh, they have one called no vars, which does exactly this. And they say that they uh, deployed it to the entire huge JavaScript code base, so I, I trust them. And also you can see it's more lines than my code. Right? If, if the number of lines is any indication of the quality, it's uh, almost 300 lines. Um, you still have to take it with a grain of salt, you still have to test it, uh, but it, it, it does uh, solve the problem that my original uh, naive solution uh, just failed at. So I have the original source code here with uh, uh, using var both times, but one time I'm calling the console log inside the scope and the other I don't. And you can look at the transformation. They were smart enough to maintain the var statement for the one where uh, there is a problem, but in the second case where it's in the same scope, it can be transformed into a const uh, declaration. So my point here about uh, being careful with these transformations, I think JS Code Shift is going to be very popular in the next couple of months, but uh, it's not too crazy, let's say if you have a huge code base, to take maybe like a week just to uh, compose uh, uh, a transformation, okay? If it saves you from manually writing uh, code and transforming your code manually over months, it could be uh, a, 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 actually a time save in the long run. You can take a week, write a really complex transformation, write tests for it, find edge cases, uh, and then be confident enough to run it across your uh, whole code base. That's it, I'll take any questions. Uh, this is where you can find me, uh, email, Twitter, I'm also here if you wanna ask questions later, blog, and uh, I recommend going to this link. I, I made a page on uh, GitHub with all links that have to do with ASTs and how you can learn more about all of these uh, tools. Why would I try to transform code like this? Why wouldn't I already know that this is like a bad idea? So the whole state of mind for my talk is uh, if you're not the best developer in the world working alone, right? So if you're 50 guys working together, people coming in, junior developers, whatever, sure, you, I'm sure you're the best programmer in the world, you never make any mistakes, but this is a way to enforce con uh, conventions across uh, your code base, this is a way to take code that you don't know and kind of get everybody on the same page. I'm, I'm not sure if I have, I probably have only a few cases like this in my code, but after I run this transformation, I'm, I'm sure I won't have any. Uh, like I said, JS Code Shift is by Facebook, uh, another famous product by Facebook is React, and it also famously changed it, its API because it was like in beta status for a long time. So they went the extra mile, and uh, from what I've read, I don't use React personally, but uh, every time they, they introduced in the last couple of releases a breaking change to React, they also published a JS Code Shift uh, transformation, battle tested that they ran in their own code, and it lets you with just really like a couple of uh, seconds to uh, convert all your code into the new way of uh, doing this. So the question was, does the code become more complex? So uh, the, the key thing about JS Code Shift, unlike Babel, is that you expect the code to be very, very readable. Like I said earlier, you're probably going to commit the, the change code under your name on GitHub. And so if people in the company have your name and number, they know where you live, you want it to be a uh, nice, clean, readable code. Um, so you have to, it, it, and another thing it does, is uh, under the covers, like I said, it, it actually tries to maintain your white space, right? Because it knows it's going to be source code and not throwaway code. Yeah, yeah. No more questions. If you have questions, uh, you can come find me later. Thank you very much.